Thank you all for tuning in this afternoon um, to the pre-application webinar for the Texas Folklife's Apprenticeship Program. Uh, my name is Pete Brighthop, and I am the Apprenticeship Program Coordinator. And I'm joined with two fabulous um, guests this afternoon. Um, so I will quickly pass it over to uh, my colleague, Ashley, for a brief introduction, and then we will introduce our, um, our special guest. Hi everyone, my name is Ashley Garcia and I'm a media and engagement intern with Texas Folklife. I just started this semester. I'm also a PhD student at the University of Texas, um, which is how I'm doing this fellowship. So I'm really excited to be part of the organization and to um, help you all out with this webinar today. Awesome and well, welcome Craig. Hi everyone, my name is Greg Jones. I'm a uh, past uh, participant of the uh, Texas Folklife Apprenticeship Program. Um, I'm here at my job. I'm a um, informal uh, welding instructor at uh, C.E. King High School and um, also a college professor at San Jack um, Community College as well. So great. Well, thank you. <laughs> yes, yes, and thank you for for joining this afternoon, Craig. I know you've had a busy day. <laughs> so we will um, jump into the presentation here. Let me just share my screen. All right, there we are. Um, so I'm going to pin myself so we might lose Ashley and Craig for the time being, but they will be back. Um, so this afternoon, uh, quickly going to jump into um, a brief just sort of summary of the apprenticeship program. And then I will go through the program guidelines and requirements. Um, and then Ashley will take, take us through navigating the print um, and digital PDF, as well as the online application forms. And then we will end with a Q&A session with Craig, um, who has some tips and suggestions and recommendations of his own um, as someone that went through this process just last year. So Texas Folklife's program, um, apprenticeship program, has been one of the organization's flagship um, programs since the beginning of, of, of um, the organization's run. So this, the apprenticeship program, um, started in 1987, just a few years after Texas Folklife Resources um, began, and had since that time um, continued to be one of the organization's flagship programs. And so to date, we've supported almost 370 folk and traditional artists um, pass on and learn a diverse range of art forms that are practiced in communities uh, throughout the state of Texas. Um, and the program has gone over various iterations throughout the year. So currently um, it's an annual program and we award up to $3,000 to approximately eight artist mentors, um, ensuring them the opportunity to um, give one-on-one -on -one training in art, cultural or heritage practices to dedicated apprentices for up to eight months. Um, and I've highlighted some numbers and some terms here. Then also we have the italicized one-on-one -on -one and the asterisk. So this is just giving you a, um, a hint that we're going to dig into um, kind of every element of this brief little program description here um, to hopefully give you some more clarity on, you know, what the apprenticeship program actually is and if the art form that you practice um, would be a good fit. So program guidelines and requirements. So First, what are the folk and traditional arts? You know, what are these art forms that the program is um, um, hoping to support? So ultimately, right, we're, we take a very broad um, approach, you know, to the way that we define the folk and traditional, traditional arts at Texas Folk Life. And, but, you know, really what we're speaking about are art forms that are, you know, practiced within communities or cultural groups um, whose members share a common heritage, language, religion, occupation, region, or even um, familial ties of some kind. Um, and these art forms can be 
uh, take the shape of many different forms, right? We have handwork crafts, um, such as, you know, and bit and spur um, makers, um, saddle makers, all the way to um, different forms of, of sculpture and, you know, and we've supported these types of handwork crafts um, over the years. And we have verbal arts, such as storytelling, um, poetry, visual arts, um, performing arts, music, and dance, um, food ways, healing arts. Again, um, I don't wanna go through each and every category here, uh, but just to say that, you know, we are viewing the folk and traditional arts as, as, in, as broad of a, um, a way, um, you know, we, we're trying not to limit by defining them in a specific way. Um, and so ultimately, right, this program is geared towards supporting an artist mentor who is recognized by the community or cultural group um, for their expertise in the part particular art form. And then the apprentice is someone who has established skills. So we, um, the program is not necessarily meant for someone who is just beginning, a, a very, you know, just starting to learn um, a particular art form. It's someone that has spent some time um, already developing their skills and expanding their knowledge base. Um, and this apprenticeship program is for those folks um, that, you know, really demonstrate a long term, alongside their established skills, to, uh, you know, showcase a long term commitment to furthering and continuing to practice this tradition. And so again, tradition and culture bearers of all Texas based folk and traditional arts or practices. Um, with our program, we're really looking to support those arts where, you know, there might not be any other ways um, or avenues or institutions or existing infrastructure to support these traditions. So we do give priorities to traditions where the artist mentor primarily practices their art in, you know, a community setting and or has been trained in their art form outside of institutional structures. Um, but again, we realize that, you know, the one-on-one -on -one mentor apprentice model may not fit within the, the framework of certain traditions. Um, so that's just one example of where, you know, of the definitions that I've just described, there is flexibility here, right? You know, we've supported a number of group and ensemble based projects in the past, such as different dance drumming traditions or different um, needlework craft traditions where it's really sort of predicated on, um, you know, a, collect, a collection um, or a collective of folks working together on a project simultaneously. And part of the tradition is the aspect of being and, and practicing together in a group. Um, you know, so we certainly recognize that. And so again, if you have any questions about, you know, whether or not your particular art form fits within this program model, or, you know, the way that we are defining the folk and traditional arts, um, please do not hesitate to, to reach out to, um, to me or, or anyone else at Texas Folk Life um, to, to talk about, um, you know, how your art form might fit into the program. So typically we um, award, um, you know, direct artist payments. Um, and we'll talk about the, how these are scheduled, but they ultimately total to range from 2,500 to $3,000. And um, a, part of the application asks for folks to present a fairly detailed uh, a budget that itemizes how this money will be spent. Um, and over the years, we have included various different types of restrictions um, for how much money can be spent where. Um, and Ashley will go over a little bit of this when she goes to the application form. But um, suffice it to say, this year we're keeping it a little bit more open. So ultimately, it's up to the artist mentor and the apprentice or apprentices to determine how this money is allocated. Um, but just as, you know, a general rule of thumb that we've worked with, that we've gone, that we've used in the past is that the majority of this award typically goes towards paying the mentor artist for their time 
um, teaching in leading the apprenticeship, typically. But again, we recognize that um, by doing this program, sometimes mentors and apprentices, apprentices have to take time away from work, from family obligations. They might need to travel long distances to make it happen. Um, so this money can also be used towards, again, travel expenses, and then of course, um, covering any supplies and materials that might be needed to make the apprenticeship happen. Period of study. So again, the program supports apprenticeships for up to eight months in length, but this can change. Um, it doesn't, they don't necessarily need to be eight months in length. They can be slightly shorter. And really it depends on a variety of different factors, right? The type of art form that's being taught. Um, some art forms require, you know, long hours of working, you know, in a workshop setting where it is, uh, you know, slow, uh, meticulous type work. Um, and so in this case, you know, the amount of hours could be drastically more than what we have here that's on average 12 to 16 hours of instruction per month. Where on the other hand, some forms of, you know, performance-based um, traditions, possibly it's, you know, the mentor and the apprentice can meet, you know, one weekend of, of the month. Uh, but during that, that one intensive weekend, the mentor will give the apprentice, you know, a number of different exercises and songs to learn and material that's going to keep the apprentice busy, you know, over the course of the entire month until the next session. Um, so in that case, maybe the, the, number, the amount of time that's spent on the actual one-on-one -on -one instruction or the, men, the direct mentor and apprentice instruction time might be slightly lower. Um, but again, it truly really just depends on the type of um, art form that is being studied. And also with the goals. Um, and again, we'll talk a little bit about this when um, further when composing the a, a solid work plan for the program. But, you know, we found that successful applications in the past have been very clear with the goals of the apprenticeship, right? Maybe if, you know, the plan is to build an entire pair of um, custom hand-built cowboy boots over the course of, um, you know, several months, maybe that's too ambitious, right? Maybe um, just like, you know, a portion of the boot would be constructed. Um, and we've had um, programs, projects in the past that have done that, right? They've just, they've isolated certain aspects of the, uh, of the project, right? Just making a certain part of the boot, that is the apprenticeship. Um, and we found that folks that are able to really be clear in the goals um, and present them in a feasible way, that, um, that goes a long way um, in convincing the review panel um, that this is a, you know, a, a worthy apprenticeship to support. So I, you know, with all of this said, you know, it all boils down to the fact that we certainly encourage flexible work plans. And of course, with the ongoing pandemic, we have, you know, also really encourage folks to, um, you know, train the way that they feel safe training, whether that, so we've had folks that just do, have done it virtually, or there is a combination of virtual instruction and some in-person instruction. So um, all that is very, is, is okay. A question that we receive quite often um, is related to one, how do we apply to the program? Do we need to fill out two separate applications? Or we receive um, inquiries from folks that are looking for a mentor or looking for an apprentice um, and seeing if Texas Folk Life can help um, kind of put together an apprenticeship. And, you know, we have done that in the past. You know, we certainly have a, a you know, extensive network of folks that we've worked with in the past through the apprenticeship and other programming, you know, so we are able to sometimes, you know, kind of pair folks together whom we think would work well together. Um, but typically the most successful applicants are folks that have worked together in the past in some capacity um, and have some existing relationship. 
And we really find that that goes a long way in um, proving the feasibility of the, of the project um, and demonstrating how the mentor and apprentice, you know, really sort of, um, you know, live in a, a shared sense of community. So before completing the application, of course, we, we do recommend that apprentices and mentors meet together to um, discuss their ideas for the apprenticeship. And these are the main bullet points. And all of these bullet points are directly asked um, in various ways on the application form itself. So what material will be covered, where and how long training sessions will be held. Again, this relates to forming a feasible and clear, clearly defined work plan, um, again, along, along with how long the apprenticeship will last. Having a um, clearly laid out budget that's allocated um, that adds up to you know, no more than $3,000. Then ultimately discussion on why this apprenticeship is important for each person individually, as well as the shared community um, or broadly speaking. The last bit, only application is submitted through the print or digital PDF application form or the new online application um, will be considered. So just want to be sure that we that you need to fill out that application form. Um, it can't just be through a series of, of emails uh, or phone calls or something. It needs to be everything needs to be placed on that application form. And again, with all of these points that I've spoken about above, you know, we welcome the chance to talk with you further about your ideas and um, you know proposed projects, um, and we are also able to help get together, collect different portions of the application. So one of them that actually we'll speak about is, you know, work samples, right? We need, ex we need examples of past work from the mentor and the apprentice. So we're happy to help talk about ways to help get this material if you don't have it readily available. Um, and we also are more than happy to give direct application feedback on any draft um, um, versions of the narrative responses on the form itself. So here is my email address and the Texas Folk Life office phone number. The last bit I wanna talk about here is the evaluation criteria. Um, and so when the applications have been submitted, Texas Folk Life staff then moderates a panel review. And so the panel consists of folk and traditional arts specialists and past program participants. And they are the ones that review all the completed app applications and make recommendations for um, approval for the program. And of course, this is based on a, on a competitive basis. And these recommendations are based on meeting the evaluation criteria, um, which must of course be, um, you know, evident in the narrative descriptions on the application form, the apprenticeship work plan, the public presentation proposal, the budget, and the supporting materials. So we'll talk about the public presentation in a second, as well as some of the other elements here that I've already mentioned. So the evaluation criteria, this is new this year. Um, we have changed the formats to be on a, out of a 100 point scale, and we have weighted it um, in a certain way. However, if we take this first point, artistic quality and commitment, right? Two of the, the main points are the artistic strength of the artist mentor and the established skill and demonstrated commitment of the apprentice. So if this is evenly divided, then each of these points is, you know, roughly equally weighted, right? So each of these, you know, so that's to say that each of these three points are significant um, and you need to think about addressing them when you're compiling and putting together your application materials. So along with artistic quality and commitment, feasibility, this includes, right? Is the work plan doable? You know, and also is the budget appropriately related to that work plan? And then also just the idea of the likelihood of successful collaboration between the artist mentor and the apprentice. Impact, role and significance of the tradition in the community life, potential impact of apprenticeship on the continuity of the tradition. All right. A few other eligibility points apprentices must be must reside in texas 
However, in 2018, um, if I'm remembering correctly, we've opened it up. So we're artist mentors may live outside of Texas in the four surrounding states, Louisiana, New Mexico, Oklahoma, or Arkansas. And so we've had some apprenticeships over, you know, in recent years where the artist mentor is based outside of Texas. There are no age requirements um, for either the artist mentor or the apprentice to apply. And for folks that participated in last year's program, they need to wait a period of one year to apply again. The program will not fund recreations of historic artifacts or stage productions of village folk traditions that attempt to reenact lifestyles from the distant past, right? At Texas Folklife, we really um, subscribe to the an, an idea of tradition and the folk arts as being um, fluid and constantly changing and constantly being um, reflective of and also impacting contemporary life. Um, and so if there's a, a program, a project that's um, proposed that wants to somehow recreate something or, you know, ass or assumes this idea of tradition being this thing in the past that's static, that will not be funded. Um, contemporary and individual studio art projects, ongoing classes where an artist mentor instructs in a classroom situation are two points um, of eligibility that, you know, will, will cause alarm in the review panelist's mind if they see it. And some, there is some gray area on these two points. So again, please reach out to Texas Folk Life to talk about if you think you have concerns about if your project might fall into one of these categories. Um, international apprenticeships. And then again, last 2020, 2021 participants are not able to apply to this year's program. Really quickly, um, some of the participant requirements. And this is, you know, during the program, what happens um, over the course of the apprenticeship, over the course of the eight months that the participants are required to do. The main one is organizing a public presentation to share the results of their apprenticeship with their local community or communities. And we've had a large variety um, of different presentations in the past, right? They don't just need to be this an in-person presentation or workshop or demonstration, right? It can be, we've had folks do wonderful um, sort of narrative blogs in the past that have pictures and videos and narrative text that, that describes, talks about, you know, the ex their experience in the apprenticeship. You know, we've had folks um, produce videos of, of different kinds, um, various forms of social media content, and all of these things are, are wonderful ideas um, and totally viable for the public presentation component of the, the program. And then the other option that we have just started offering the past two years is the apprenticeship program virtual showcase. So this is not a requirement. However, any participant can opt into it, um, which is essentially a, a capstone event that happens near the end of the apprenticeship program period. So typically early August that showcases the apprentices and the work that they have done. And if you decide to participate in this, it fulfills your public presentation requirements. However, in your application, you still need to um, outline your proposed presentation, even if you decide to you know, participate in the showcase. You just speak about what you plan to do for the showcase. Near the middle of the program, there is a site visit or interview. And so this is where Texas Folklife, a staff member uh, from Texas Folklife will come either in person to visit the um, mentor and the apprentice, or it'll be held virtually um, through Zoom or a phone call of some kinds, right? Um, and along with this, you know, in the pre-pandemic era, um, Texas Folk Life would be the ones going out and documenting with, with photography and video recording and audio recording. Um, but now since this type of in-person work is, um, you know, kind of on a case-by-case -case basis, Texas Folk Life has also been encouraging folks to experiment with their own self-documentation. So taking their own photos, taking their own videos, um, or creatively documenting their works together. Um, and so we are, Texas Folk Life is offering various forms of resources to help bolster some of those self-documentation skills as well. So folks might be asked to do that type of work along with their actual apprenticeship. 
At the end of the program, um, all artist teams submit a written report. And this is really just a, a wonderful opportunity for folks to not only document what they've worked on, but you know, reflect on their experience and give Texas Folk Life feedback to try and make the program um, better for, in, for future iterations. A couple of quick notes that all the documentation that's taken um, during the course of the apprenticeship will be stored in Texas Folk Life Digital Archive and participants will have full access to the respective materials. Um, and in many cases, Texas Folk Life will work along with the uh, participants to create um, you know, education or pro promotional content that's showcasing the participants' work. So you can go to um, texasfolklife.org slash apprenticeships and see um, a collection of multimedia features um, of past um, participants. And this stems from, you know, write up summary articles to um, video recordings, podcast, audio storytelling clips, um, and, and everything in between. For the last bit here, the awards are distributed in three payments. So it's a three thousand dollar, up to three thousand dollars total. But this award, this um, um, amount is broken into three payments, roughly evenly. However, there is flexibility if you need to get more money sooner to, to buy um, supplies and materials, for instance, that's totally okay. Um, but this happened, the first one happens after the signing of the contract. Um, so the beginning of the program, you know, late January, early February, after the site visit slash interview, which happens, you know, kind of late spring, early summer, and then after the completion of the public presentation and submission of the final written report. And here is just a breakdown of the 2022 timeline um, with specific dates that you can um, review. So that is where I will stop here and I will pass this to um, Ashley. All right. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, hopefully all of you can see my screen and it's the program um, application online. So I'm gonna go ahead and take you through our application um, that's online using a website called Survey123. So we have three different application forms available to you. A paper application that you can print out and complete physically by hand, a digital PDF paper application, right? That you can fill out um, through Adobe, or this online application. So I'm gonna take you through the online one that you can find in our website. And there are three main components to this online application. The application form itself, a section where you can add supplemental materials, including samples of your own work. And then the last is a consent form. So the first thing that we ask you to do when completing the application is to look over uh, the program guidelines and requirements that Pete just went over. So after you do that, we're going to ask you for basic contact information uh, from your apprenticeship team, which includes the artist mentor and also the apprentice that you can see here. It's really just your name and address. But at the bottom of this contact information, we also ask how you learned about the apprenticeship program. This is information that we would really love to know about. Um, and something that I wanna bring your attention to now is this little number in the right-hand corner, 350. So that is your character count. When you start typing in the box, you can see the character count going down. So just keep in mind as you work through the online application that there are character limits for each text box. Um, so uh, it will show you as you type how many words and how many characters you have left, but just make sure you check that as you're going along. So that was the basic component of the application. Now we're gonna move on to part A and part B. Part A and B should be filled out by both the master and the apprentice together. So these two sections are collaborative. Part A consists of really just one component and that is to describe your traditional art form. And you can see in the bottom right hand corner again that you have 1200 characters for this text box, which is about 200 words. And then moving on to, am I sharing? Yeah, moving on to part B. We ask for a description of the apprenticeship. Um, so this, again, you will fill out together as a team. You can see that there are going to be four text components to part B, right? So we ask you to complete four questions. Uh, 
And all of these have a different character count. So the first box has a thousand characters, whereas the second one gives you 1200. So keep that in mind. And the third text box under part B asks for an apprenticeship schedule. Okay, so we give you a thousand characters to cover these five bullet points of what we want you to include. And you can list these things line by line, or you can go ahead and address all of these bullet points in one paragraph. It's really up to you. Um, and the thousand characters should really be more than enough space to give you a full outline of the apprenticeship. And then the last component of part B really asks about our virtual showcase down here. So Pete kind of just talked about this. It's an opportunity that we're offering to potential apprenticeship participants to showcase their work. Um, so we'd love you to indicate whether this is something that your artist team would be interested in doing. So moving on to part C and D of the application, these are gonna be filled out by the mentor and apprentice individually, even though they're very similar. So part C is for the artist mentor. We ask them to complete this section individually and it has four components. Um, the first, ask the mentor to describe their background and experience in the art tradition. The second, the significance of that tradition. The third, we ask how the mentor knows the apprentice. And then lastly, we ask what impact this apprenticeship will have on the mentor's community. Each box here has a thousand character limit. Now part D, as you'll see, is to be filled out by the apprentice only, but it's almost identical to part C. Um, this section again has four components that ask the apprentice to describe their background and experience in the tradition, the importance of that tradition, why they wanna participate in the program, and then what the apprentice's plans are to continue with the art form. And again, each text box has a thousand character limit. So the next part of the application is E, and this is the dreaded budget, um, <laughs> but we try to make it easy for you. So we ask the artist mentor and apprentice to report their proposed budget together here. And there are four sections listed that include the artist mentor fees, the supplies and materials cost, the cost of travel, and then any other miscellaneous costs. And I'm gonna show you, if you look at the first box here, there are some numbers, it's one, two, three. This is where you'll enter the number, the total cost for the artist mentor's fees. And then this text box right below it allows you to really itemize and kind of describe the specific costs. And then in this text box, you're gonna also specify who will be using those supplies or who the intended recipient of the money is. And then at the very end of the section, if you notice after the four subtotals, you'll see a total box, right? The sum of subtotals one through four. Now this online application form isn't going to automatically total those sums for you. Um, and if you don't feel comfortable doing that, it's totally okay. Um, we've actually included um, a separate budget form here. It's a PDF, a fillable PDF that you can download and it will automatically sum the totals for you. So you can fill that out separately and then go ahead and upload it as a PDF here if that's easier for you. So we're just giving you that option if you need it. Now the last really big part, and it is really big part of our application is the supporting materials. Now this includes your work samples and then your letters of support. So I'm gonna start with your letters of support here. Um, and we've really provided a lot of information on both the paper and online application because we know this part is a little complicated. Um, so if anything is just going over your head right now um, because I'm working through it fast, please come back to this part of the application, use it as your guide. So both the artist mentor and the apprentice have to submit work samples and at least one letter of support. So the letter of support for the mentor artist should really be from an individual who can speak to the artist mentor's qualifications in their art form. Um, and then the um, apprenticeship's impact on that community. And then the letter of support for the apprentice uh, should really come from an individual who can speak to the potential of that apprentice and knows about the traditional art form. Now we do offer an alternative to the letters of support. Um, if you can't have someone write a traditional letter on eight and a half by 11 paper um, presented on letterhead, that's totally okay. So in lieu of writing a record uh, letter, uh, we can have recommenders fill out um, a recommendation form that we offer online. So this form still asks the recommender to talk about the relationship with the artist or the mentor 
um, or the apprentice, sorry, and the ability of the mentor or apprentice um, and the importance of the art form, but it's less traditional um, than the normal letter um, and it might be a little more accessible. So if you do have someone write a formal letter of recommendation, we do have two upload buttons right here. One for the artist, one mentor, and one for the apprentice where you can upload PDFs or Word docs of those letters. So for your word samples, these are the big one. Take you to our work sample index. This is a guide that we created for you all that I really suggest you go back to if you need it. Uh, because depending on the art form here, your work samples are going to be different, right? Different art forms will require different samples of your work. If you're a visual artist or craftsperson, um, you might submit visual images instead of, you know, being a musician who's going to submit two or three recordings of, you know, you performing your art form. Um, so we ask that you take a look here and depending on your art form, we give you the required um, work sample and the amount of that work sample. Once you know what type of work sample you're going to submit, we ask you to check some boxes here, depending on the sample. So if you're gonna submit images, you can click the images box. If you're going to select, if you're gonna submit images and audio samples, you can click both. If you make a mistake, um, and let's say you click the written samples box when you're not submitting any written samples, just unclick the box, it's pretty easy. And then we also allow you to submit supporting documentation here. Um, so if you think that this is relevant to your application and it might include any articles or press about you or booklets or other media you want us to see, then you can also upload those. So once you've checked all of the boxes, we ask you to list your work samples with some descriptions and URLs if you have them here in this text box below. So if you're submitting six work samples, we ask you to fill out um, this text box according to this guide that we presented up here, right? So you would type in, work sample one, and then you would follow this format with the title of the work sample, its format or URL, any description, and then its relevance to the apprenticeship. And we're gonna ask that you follow the same format for any supporting documentation. Now this text box allows you to submit um, a thousand characters, which should be more than enough to list all of your work samples. So once you've indicated the type of work sample and any supporting documentation you're gonna send us, um, there are two different ways you can submit all of these samples. The first way is to upload the files uh, through this application form here. And you can see you can upload work samples for the mentor and the apprentice, um, both here for the mentor and then down below for the apprentice. Or if you'd rather um, send them to us via email, you can always do that as well. Um, we provided an email address um, earlier in the presentation, um, and you can also find that on our website. So you can send that directly to us if you'd rather do that. Um, and then again, the mentor and the apprentice will do the same thing for their letters of rec and work samples. So last but not least, we've made it to the end. This is part G of the application. It's our consent form. So this is a uh, giving consent to Texas Folklife for the use of your application materials. This consent form uh, gives folk, Texas Folklife use of the work samples and the responses you submit in this application and any future promotional or educational materials kind of like Pete was talking about before. Now, if you don't wanna have your application materials used in our promotional or educational materials, then you don't have to sign this form. Right, so instead of signing it here, you can go to the bottom and check this box. Um, it is completely up to you. Um, but if you do, then you can go ahead and sign the box. And then the last thing that we ask you to do is just submit the application. Make sure you do that at the end. <laughs> so on the online form, um, you're just gonna press submit at the end here. Um, if you filled out a paper application, you can mail it to us or you can email it to us. Um, so. Yeah, we have different options here. We hope that it's, it's useful and that you take advantage. Um, and if you need any help with any part of the application, please let us know. You can email either of us. Um, we're just here to help. Awesome, thank you, Ashley. And maybe um, tell folks, or work, can you just reshare your screen and work folks through the online application form, the saving mechanism? because it should, it saves work automatically. Oh, you're muted, Ashley. 
Oh, sorry. Okay, so you'll notice in the top left-hand corner, it says reset and saved. So as you work through the application, you can kind of see where it says saved. Anytime I click on something, it says saving and then save, right? So if for some reason you do want to reset, if you've messed up, um, you can go ahead and reset and then it will completely discard the entire draft that you've worked through. Um, so, you know, make sure before you do that, that you're certain. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so it automatically saves for you as you're working through the application, right? And just to double check, you can look up there, but make sure when you get to the end of the application that you do submit it. <laughs> Great, thanks. And I'm just going to quickly share my screen to show the, um, this is the digital PDF form. So we have the digital PDF form and also a print PDF form. So if you don't feel comfortable using the online form, that's, that is totally okay. So we have this print, or the, sorry, the digital PDF here, which has uh, text boxes, which you can directly edit through your um, PDF reader, whether that be if you're using a Mac computer preview or Adobe. Um, and unlike the character limits on the online application form, we have word limits here. And the word limits and the character limits are are the same, right? So don't feel like you're going to get more space on one or the other. So these these limits are the same but just we have them listed as words in the PDF form and the print form. So just like the online application, it has all the same sections and asks for all the same material. Um, and this can be filled out and we have, um, again, so the work sample index, um, all, all the components are, are, are in these applications. And you can submit this um, by email or you can mail it a physical copy to Texas Folk Life. Um, you know, any, any way is fine. So there are the application forms. So I think we can move on here. Let's, um, Craig, you've been waiting so patiently. So I, <laughs> I know we're both excited to, to hear your thoughts. Um, and again, Craig participated in last year's program. Um, and Craig focus on accordion building. Um, and where I'm excited to hear his thoughts because he um, and his mentor, Mr. Ed Poulard, submitted a very um, thoughtful and to the point application. Um, so I think Craig's tips and suggestions and recommendations are, will be very, very useful. Um, so I think we can maybe just start off Craig, and maybe talk about why you generally wanted to apply to the apprenticeship program. Okay. So first of all, I want to say thank you for having me. And um, also, um, just it's an awesome program. Um, Texas Folk Life is putting out this apprenticeship program for uh, you guys to actually learn um, and keep in the heritage and cultures of these skills and whatever you um, partake in in the arts and things to um, keep it alive. Um, I actually reached out to Ed Pular to um, wanting to learn how to build accordions because my love of accordions and the uh, um, traditional uh, Creole uh, Cajun music. And he suggested to um, go through the Texas Folk Life program. He's done it uh, several times throughout uh, his years of uh, building and also doing music. Um, I think his earliest one was like in the mid eighties, maybe early eighties. And um, I didn't, I didn't even know anything like this existed with uh, Texas Folk Life. So um, I looked into it that night when he suggested it to me, because I was so eager that I wanted to uh, learn how to do this um, building. So I got on, I contacted uh, Charlie and then he got me through you. And you're like, hey, you just came at the right time. <laughs> and I was like so happy because I, I thought I had missed it. But um, I got online, um, got the, um, the application form, uh, filled out the app 
clarification as best as I could. I mean, we they, the questions are pretty straightforward to me. I mean, um, it was a few things that uh, Mr. Poulard helped me on, but other than that, just kind of that whole thing of cost. Because, I mean, I didn't know exactly how much went into the building these instruments. But when you break it down, you're like, oh, okay, now I see why the price is so increased because of the price of reeds, fellows, and things like that. So um, breaking that cost down, that was probably one of my, my challenges as well as getting the actual materials. But um, yeah, um, I think I wish I would have had this um, uh, webinar before. I mean, this is an awesome thing that y'all guys are doing. Um, or as the webinar goes. Thank you, Greg. Do you want to, I have actually your application pulled up. Do you want to quickly, sh I can quickly share my screen so people can see your, the budget sure. that you put you together. Can. Are you comfortable with that? Yeah, that's fine. Sure, so let me just share my screen here. And so this is the budget that Craig and, and um, Ed submitted. So as you can see, as I mentioned, right, the large, you know, out of the three thousand dollars, two thousand of this was going to artist mentor fees that was paid directly to Mr. Poulard, and then here are all of the the itemized list that that Craig you said that you had a a heck of a time trying to <laughs> figure I'm out. I'm laughing because I'm looking at the wood, and you remember the story <laughs> I told you. So um, that pricing was totally wrong, <laughs> but um, just um, for. Uh, FYI, people um, that are deciding to do this, that I had to come out of pocket on a lot of um, fees and on my material bills. And, um, you know, that's okay. If, you, if you're if you like me, I'm dead set on doing this apprenticeship program. So coming out of pocket was no biggie for me. You know, I just had to kind of go on a foot chase to finding things that was going to be feasible for me where I felt comfortable paying. And um, I, I learned a lot of hard ways along the way. Um, one board <laughs> cost me $180, $189. So yeah, um, the breakdown was, um, it was kind of a little bit different because actually I put it for fuel and meals was gonna be out of pocket, but um, we actually, um, did some more out of pocket on the um, materials as well. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and thank you for sharing that honest feedback, Craig. And I think that's one reason why you, if you see what we have here, we have these must not exceed limits. Um, and this is last year's application. And so we have not included these in this year's application um, to try and hopefully give folks a bigger sense of flexibility to try and, um, you know, negotiate some of those possibly supply and material expenses that might be, that might, you know, be more than $500, for instance. Um, so just to make that quick note, I'll stop sharing here. Great. And so, you know, just from a logistical standpoint, Greg, how did you and Mr. Poulard just complete the application? What was your process for just getting it done? Well, I met with him and um, we kind of did the first day was kind of a orientation, you know, what was expected of me, what was expected of him. And uh, we just kind of went through the uh, application process or application to our widows. I printed out several copies and we kind of wrote things down what he felt like because he's old school. And But he actually uh, gets on a computer and does things. So <laughs> it's pretty cool. But um, so what I did was just take both of our applications and then merged them together in that PDF. And uh, while he was telling me some of the stuff verbally, verbally, I was just typing it up, you know, on his part, like um, how did he get started and kind of his brief bio on that and just um, kind of collaborating together. And um, we just did it all together in one, one sitting. So that was, that was good. And were there any other, I know, you know, getting the budget figured out was was difficult and it didn't ultimately line up with the, with the project. But were there any other challenges that you specifically faced, um, you know, maybe not during your apprenticeship, but while completing the application? Uh, not any other challenges. Uh, that, that was fine. Uh, okay. Getting those parts, yeah. 
I, I'm trying to, I was trying to lead you because there is something about your uh, application process that I wanted to highlight. Um, What's that? Go ahead. And that was because, you know, you are a professional metal worker, right? Yeah. And um, proposing an accordion building apprenticeship, you felt like possibly you didn't have like the, as many examples of your woodworking skills as you, you might've liked. Um, yes. Um, am I remembering well, correctly? Yes, 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 yes. Um, you know, being a wood a metal worker, I, I very seldom touch wood. I mean, if we build anything with, with metal, if we have to incorporate some wood, it may be like a tabletop or something like that. So this apprenticeship, and actually helped me a lot um, on uh, being precise, more precision with my wood or with my metalworking as well. I mean, usually uh, if it's a 16 of an inch off, I'm just going to leave it <laughs> and weld over it. Bam, I'm done. If I cut it 16th of an inch too short, hey, we can, we can put it together and make it work. We're just filling the gap, but with woodworking, you can't do that. Um, you know, you have to be dead on, especially with this musical instrument. I mean, if it's off, it's off and you're going to have big gaps or, and anytime you have gaps, this leaks. So, um, that, that was a, a big problem, but, um, you know, we discussed that on, um, you and I was that, Hey, you know, you have some form of some skill where you're working with your hands. So, you know, I'm glad you guys kind of looked at it that way because I did do some woodworking, but, you know, it wasn't nothing, nothing on the category of this um, according to Bill. I mean, there are some times I was like, oh my God, I was overwhelmed. <laughs> it's, a, it's a machinist wood wood is what you're doing. You know, and I think this is, I wanted to highlight this just to, you know, in the beginning of this presentation, I, I described an apprentice as somebody that has an established skill, um, you know, in the art form. And like, I think Craig is a, um, a fantastic example of someone that um, was able to showcase like his deep repertoire of professional um, metalworking um, as an artist and as an educator. Um, but then he combined that with um, a very clear and passionate appeal to why he wanted to learn how to build accordions. Um, also, along with sending some pictures of some past woodworking um, examples, Craig also, you know, from the application, it became very clear that he, uh, uh, accordion, um, Creole expressive forms and Zydeco, it's, you know, was significant to your upbringing and just sort of, you know, your general sense of self. Um, so I think by having all those elements together, it was, it painted a really clear picture to the review panelists that, hey, like, you know, although this particular apprentice, you know, hasn't necessarily built an accordion, he has the technical foundation and skills to do so. And he has the, um, you know, membership in the cultural community. You know, you've lived this music and the, this, this art form and, you know, this instrument your entire life. Um, so I think that really played, um, was a, you know, presented a strong case to the, to the review panelists. So I, I, <laughs> I want to embarrass you one more time. Is it okay oh, if we, if we <laughs> so, cause some, so some folks ask questions too about what um, types of work samples that they should um, submit, especially mm -hmm. if maybe they don't have as much as, you know, if, like in Craig's case, have, you know, working in a different medium in some cases. So Craig submitted a, a video of him sort of describing his, his relationship to Zydeco and the accordion, um, and also plays a little bit too. Um, so I just wanted to show this um, because I um, think that it, it added an important component um, to the application. So let me just share my screen one last time. I'll share with sounds. There we go. Hi, Craig Jones here. I'm applying for the Texas Folklife Apprenticeship Program. A little bit about me. I grew up in the rural parts of Southeast Texas uh, where uh, Zydeco music and Creole music ran deep. Uh, at a young age, I uh, started listening to Zydeco music and um, it became part of my life. Um, a little bit 
about myself as um, education. I uh, graduated from Sam Houston State University with a minor in education and a major in industrial engineering. Um, what I hope to gain out of this apprenticeship program is to learn how to build these accordions. Uh, I've been always intrigued by the craftsmanship and the time that is, goes into um, building such a wonderful instrument. And I hope um, one day I can um, continue the tradition into building these accordions and uh, make music with them. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> awesome. I Thanks for all about that video. <laughs> but I think it it's um it was a strong piece of of, of like a work sample to submit um because I think it really touched on all of those elements um the artistic quality and commitment you know the feasibility also the impact like all these aspects I think were you know you were able to address in a, a minute and a half um so. Yeah, I think that's a, a really great example of a, of a really powerful work example. Um, so I guess the last thing that I want to ask you is just, do you have any just general tips or recommendations for folks that are, you know, interested in the program um, or applying to the program? Yeah, uh, just plan your work, work your plan, uh, document, uh, document everything that from start to finish. Um, take plenty of pictures, video if you can. Um, even document your time that you were um, meeting um, and your travels and things like that. Um, and there are some times where me and Mr. Pular, we get together and we just start working. And the next thing I know, I'm like, hey, I forgot to take pictures of step one, step two, step three. And I'm like, oh, man, now I got to go back and try to mimic some things. And um, it's just not even for just uh, – presentation sake it's just for yourself um in case you ever want to go back and try to um do this on your own um you have that documentation to go back on and and kind of study um one thing he did suggest and i did um the very next day was i bought a kind of a diary a little black diary and i wrote every single measurement um that i could every step i i tried to write it down as um technical as possible, step one, insert screw here, <laughs> you know, and um, that way, and I, I study it. Um, the other night, I, I got kind of bored at home, you know, being on the uh, holiday uh, break, and I got my book out, and I just started recapping on some things that we done um, in the beginning that I have totally forgot how to do, you know, I kind of try to quiz myself um, and get yeah, I call it my study guide because Ms. Pular will um, test you <laughs> and he will pop out a question real quick and you got to be quick on your feet <laughs> and he'll tell you, you just failed. <laughs> and I've had a whole bunch of those. So um, we don't want any more of those. So we just try to um, document everything you can um, and then always communicate with your, your mentor. Um, just kind of, pick days where you're both going to be free and um, that way you guys can really get in there and um, do your jobs and, and have a good time doing it as well. Um, which leads me to uh, the favorite part was the actual build. <laughs> I, I think I have more fun um, building these things than probably actually playing them. Um, I want, we actually not quite finished with the entire build. We just installed reeds. Uh, what was that weekend before last week? We got to go out there and uh, work a little bit. So now is the uh, tuning process. So once we get it tuned, we kind of do adjustments, fine tuning, and then another adjustment. And I think we got one more tuning after that. And then they should be um, worthy of playing. <laughs> and stage playing so 
yeah, they're um, there's my babies, <laughs> um, my creations. Yeah, they are beautiful. I cannot wait to to hear them, Craig. Oh yeah, yeah, I, I can't wait either. But um, it's it's been a long journey, and I tell you, I wouldn't have traded one minute of it. I mean, it's it's an awesome experience. Uh, I look forward to going to uh, Mr. Poulard's every weekend I could. Um, we usually try to go um, three to four weekends in a month. Um, but like I said, I look forward to it. I mean, that was my my weekend look forward to deal. So, and um, I I do you know there was some flexibility because I know you know we had you know, the big winter storm here in Texas. And I just, you know, maybe can you just give folks a sense of the fact that like, you know, you know, you set a work plan, but you know, it's ultimately up to you to, you know, to be flexible with your, with your mentor and to find times. Right. Yes. And it's, you know, your mentor, it works both ways, you know, um, like during the holiday, uh, he wants to spend time with his family. I want to spend time with my family. So, you know, we try to uh, work things out where we could have that time to spend. Um, I'm being an educator. I get off on the uh, holiday seasons. So um, I would try to go during the week um, sometimes. And then the summertime, I, I had um, times where I went during the week as well. So because uh, Mr. Poulard's retired. So um, it worked out for him and and me as well to do that as well. So. Yeah, um, it was just get your schedules together and um, hope everybody good luck and um, hope everyone has a good job. <laughs> I like to see um, the projects. I'm, I'm really interested in being more part of this with the um, kind of seeing what everyone comes up with. Yes. Awesome. Well, Craig, thank you so much for, for taking the time this afternoon. I know. Um, we are very thankful. Let me just see if I can get to the next. It's not letting me. There we go. Our final thank you slide. Um, again, my name is Pete Breithop, and I am the apprenticeship program coordinator. And I am here with um, Ashley. You can you can jump on and. <laughs> um, yeah, with, and I'm Ashley Garcia again, <laughs> media engagement fellow. <laughs> um, and you know, Ashley and I are you know both. Um, excited and willing to review and work with with y'all through the application process, um, as well as, of course, throughout the entire program. So do not hesitate to, to email either of us. Um, and we look forward to, to learning about whatever one's up to.